Minnesota. Good evening. Hmm? Cyprus, the island where I am from, in 2013 went into a very big financial crisis, and the funds for the arts were seriously reduced. As a contemporary performance maker, this was a very difficult financial time for me, and a time where I remember myself going up and down into the kitchen and thinking, "What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I didn't know what to do." Then I said, "You know what? I'm going to step out into the city and offer my services as an artist to society." I would do what I knew how to do best: performances. But then I was thinking. Is there a need for my performances? Are people want to experience this? Is performance a necessity or a luxury in today's society? And even more, are performances enough? Important enough today? So this gave rise to a whole artistic project that was a rather ironic concept that would totally look and point and focus on the value of performance today and whether it was worth anything. I decided to create a performance shop. I chose the frame of a shop as an accessible and familiar structure, recognizable by all, and I was also very attracted to this word "shop" because I thought it could really provoke discussions and open up debates about different issues, like, for example, performance as a commodity or the relationship between performance and consumption, and themes like that. So I was dreaming that we could be,、um, for example, practicing performance practices from day to night in the middle of every dayness, and maybe this could answer some of these questions. So, the performance shop opened in the frame of the pop-up festival in Nicosia, where they would give、uh, different kinds of、uh, shops that were previously closed down by the crisis to artists to make their art available for one month. So we would have,、uh, we were situated in the middle of the city. We had all sorts of different performances,、uh, from performing art and performance art, and live art in general. And all these performances were listed in a catalog that looked like a menu. So we had performances, as you can see, from different、uh, artists on display in the window of the shop, where passers-by could sit for however long they wanted to、um, watch these performances that were usually long durational. And it wasn't like a theater that they would sit and wait for the performance to finish, so they were free to leave whenever. We had、uh, performances to order. At home or in our premises, and we also had participatory performances for one spectator or two spectators or more. Now there was a wonderful vibe going on because people were wondering what is this extraordinary things happening in the middle of the ordinary. As you can see here, the lovely Euripides the Lascarides、uh, is in the middle of the street, looking not very normal. <laughs> And then,、uh, yeah, so people were watching outside. They were watching from inside the different performances. They were listening, more listening, and、uh, experiencing in general,、uh, as well as participating. A lot of participating, some sometimes too much. <laughs> so this crowd generally was not the crowd you would usually have in a contemporary art gallery or in a theater,、um, and it was wonderful because some of them didn't know, know what performance is. So for us to watch them experience a whole world being revealed to them and uh, uh, looking at them experiencing all these kind of、uh, creative practices was wonderful. Nevertheless, there was a wonderful vibe, but there was a paradox going on. We were offering performances as a product, and at the same time, nobody was taking anything home with them. So, what exactly were we offering, and was it worth it or valuable in any way? I will show you a few examples from our performances that might answer that question. For example, this performance was for one spectator. It was called Hand. And it, she would sit on a chair. There was a hole, and she would、um, pass her hand through the hole and reach another body, the body of the performer. Now the performer would take this hand on a journey through touch, allowing the participant to experience different kinds of body parts. And in the end, 
uh, the participant would really get lost, like what body part is what body part, and surrender to these stimulations coming from the performer on the hand. Now, now, participants coming out of this performance were literally and emotionally touched. And one of them even con uh, confessed to us that he never had so much concentrated attention given to him at any time before. There's another one. And this performance skin was a development of hand. Again, the participant was blindfolded, and he was taken on a journey, this time by three performers of touch and sound. Things like the floor under his um, feet would change texture, and he would indulge into playfulness and the joy of laughing, um, and different stuff like that. And then when they were coming out, they were like, they wanted to, um, they wanted to meet the performers because they went through they shared all this journey but we were like no you're not gonna meet them if you want you can leave letters for them and here's one it was fun intense time flew quickly and even time disappeared or this one uh, thank you I came intense and I'm living happy and intrigued or this one she describes the journey and in the end she says thank you for this present and then this one, it says, I think I kept thinking, as I was on this journey, I have faith in humanity. So people were actually living with something from the shop, but this something wasn't tangible, but it doesn't mean it wasn't precious. So what exactly were they living with, and was it valuable in any way? They were leaving with time and space from the, for themselves. We were giving them back the stolen time and space that was stolen from them, from the everyday intense way of living. The hope that all the performances were creating an atmosphere, a safe environment where people could go deeper into experiencing wonderful things like their vulnerability or their sensitivity in a protected and guided way. Also, this beautiful art form performance is all about communication. It's all about contact. Either that's eye contact, or physical contact, or verbal communication between the spectator and the artwork, or the spectator and the artist. Now, they might have not taken anything home with them that was tangible, but they were taking all these values that are very rare in today's way of, thinking, of living. If we look back, performance in ancient times was all about rituals where communities would come together and celebrate life and nature. It was part of their everydayness that they would come together, sing, dance and experience ecstasy through rhythm and music. Actually, the word ecstasy we all know here comes from the Greek ecstasis, which means standing outside of oneself, transforming, evolving, finding a new version of oneself. So in a sense, in ancient times, art was all about collective bonding and personal development. Adam Krauss, in his book, Art as Politics, says, art arose from the everyday experience and should still be part of that experience. Nowadays, art has been separated from life, and it has been put into special places like museums, galleries, and it serves art industries that very much determine each art form's value, trends, and audience development. In an era of specialization and knowledge, art is also treated like some kind of special science, only for the few who understand it. But what about the rest? This disconnection and isolation separates the others, making them feel that they're not worthy of the art form. So what about making connections instead of divisions and allowing art to connect to everydayness or art to connect to sciences or art to connect to the artist in everyone? Because we do have an artist in everyone, either as a creator or as an appreciator. This connection needs two things, confidence and action. In The Active Spectator, we had a wonderful uh, performance in the shop, The Active Spectator, with 12 spectators and one actor, Marios Ioannou. Marios would project on the spectators different kinds of characters to which they naturally reacted to. For example, he would tell them, Hi, kids! 
did you finish from your break? What did you eat for lunch today? So, of course, they had to react as kids. Now, there were seven of those transformations, and people were coming out of the show in trance, transformed, because they stepped out of their comfort zone and into different embodiments that made them broaden up their limits uh, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And art, performance, can do that. It can make us active, as we are very often fast asleep, in systems that really make it their business not to open up our creative potential, because that is often a very big threat to power. Being active is also about taking choices. Either these choices are small or big breakthroughs. And art can do that also, or help us do that. In the shop, we had a show called Your Funeral Show, this performance to order came from my dad's funeral. I went to my dad's funeral, and I was too emotional to speak. So this guy stands up and starts talking about my father in a way that was not representative at all of him. And I was thinking, if my dad was here, he would really not be happy about this. Um, so the funeral show was all about one artist and one spectator to collaborate so that somebody can have actually a say in his last ritual his funeral. They could work together to, for the participant to maybe have a say about the music or the aesthetic, or even write their own funeral um, speech. Why not? So the artist is very much also at service to society, helping people find their creative potential. One of my favorite artists, Alan Moore, beautifully says that the grandfather of the artist was the shaman. And the shaman, as an ancient magician, he would use rituals that would cure and help people have breakthroughs and awakenings. I say that today the artist, as ever, is a wonderful person, very special, that puts their soul on display for use and consumption by others. Specifically, the performer will sacrifice their socially accepted self and embody different kinds of embodiments and characters that are very often perceived as slightly humiliating by others. But it is these embodiments that will shock, that will surprise, and that will make people want to copy, avoid, or even have a chance to even imagine their own creative potential. I call this notion of the artist narcissistic philanthropy. Because for me, it's about the performers loving the exhibiting part, but also sharing that with the world for their own use. Dimitra Kalitsi was at service in our shop, and she placed a double bed in the window of the shop, and she made herself available for people to come down and lie down next to her. Now, as you can see, there's a guy there. The sex industry made sure that any physical contact is um, associated with guilt, fear, uh, and a bad use of whatever sex can mean. So they we're very often missing out on other forms of physical contact. Outside our shop, there was a rock bar, and people were queuing. And you could see some rough, tough-looking boys and girls, but as they were stepping in this room, they were becoming cuddly beings, rediscovering the joy of caress, enjoying being together, breathing together, being not alone. This year, actually, sorry, going back to my um, <laughs> photographs, performance as service, values, intimacy, togetherness, sensitivity, empathy, rare qualities in today's time. This year, we opened up again uh, our shop in uh, the Athens Festival in Athens. And apart from performance as service, performance as experience, and performance as action, performance as spectacle was something that really added to the value of performance today. The windows of the shop suddenly became gates of communication and platforms where people could share their selves with the world. 
In the piece by Thanasis Gritsakis called Exercising Democracy, he would sit in the window for 24 hours listening to people that could speak in a microphone that was outside. These people were speaking and saying different things, and Thanasis would not reply, and I could see people being totally aware, because they were listening to themselves, of stating and making statements, and therefore becoming adults in an instance. Tag, a company called Tag, this uh, um, piece, anybody could step in the window, see and be seen, hear and be heard, sharing themselves with the world. And lastly, Marina Gennadieva, she would sit for six hours and put on her face glittery wrapping paper to create a mask. She then went around town, as you can see here in Athens, and people were watching, or rather staring, and laughing at her and saying things like, why? Why is she there? Why is she like this? And I want to answer this question with another question. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not choose how we want to carry ourselves in the world? Why not choose everything about us? It's our body, it's our existence. Why not choose our clothes? Why not choose our genders? Why not choose our environment, our people, everything around us? We have that right. And we need to take that right back. And art and performance are there to remind us. So performance as spectacle gave us the chance to form what one chooses to be at any time and share it with the world. The pleasure of celebrating difference and therefore celebrating life. The space to create communities of shared values. And the right, again, to ecstasy. Today's world has almost lost its chance for survival. And I believe it is now more than ever that performance is absolutely necessary since it can stand as a daily reminder to humans that they do have a choice. They can be choosing creation over destruction in everything they do, and that is not a luxury. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.